let's have a word of prayer as we begin. So, Father, we thank you so much for your grace, your spirit, your anointing. Holy Spirit, you are the greatest teacher. We ask that you teach this morning like only you can, that there be a rhema word in the house for every heart that's here, a word that challenges us and convicts us and draws us closer to your heart. It's our sincere desire to better know you that we may better serve you. And we covenant with you alone to give you the praise, glory, and adoration for what has already taken place by faith in the outset. I come against every assignment of the enemy that will try to steal the word and gain lodgment inside of your heart today. But you will walk out of this place 10,000 times stronger, 10,000 times wiser, and more equipped to face the mountains that seem too hard to overcome. Holy Spirit, we rely on you. You're the greatest teacher. Teach us like only you can. We give you praise and thanks for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. Look at your neighbor this morning and say, neighbor, this is your year to take the land. Amen. We have begun a new series of teaching last week entitled Take the Land. Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Joshua chapter 1, verse number 11. Joshua chapter 1, verse number 11. We will utilize this verse as our reference point uh, or foundation for this collection. Um, I'm trying to maneuver from saying series to collection. Uh, so we'll be utilizing this passage of Scripture for our foundational reference. And in Joshua 1, verse 11, I'm there, so we are going to begin to read. And I'm reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. It says, Pass through the camp and command the people, saying, Prepare provision for yourselves. For within three days you will cross over this Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess. Last week we were together, we realized and understood that that word land is eretz in the Hebrew. What that meant identifies our nation's wilderness and way. When we discuss the subject land, I'm not just talking about the vacant lot that is down the street from your home. When I'm talking about take the land, I'm talking about whatever areas that have systems of law, wealth, and resources God has commissioned us as the kingdom to take that land. And the reason why we are called and assigned to take it is because whoever controls the land has the power to convert its systems. They have the power to convert and establish laws. And they have the fortitude to direct resources and wealth. The word possess is yarash in the Hebrew, and it also means to seize and to occupy. Revelation chapter number 11, verse 15, gives us direction on why we have this assignment. And I don't know what your personal uh, purpose is in life in detail, meaning what your gift is, what your ability is. But when you and I became engrafted into the kingdom of God, we are, have all taken, up, taken it upon ourselves to play a hand in the bigger picture that God is looking to establish here in the earth. So you may be here today and feel like your life is without direction. You may be here this morning looking for purpose. I can assure you that whatever your gift, talent, or ability is, it is connected to the assignment that we are going to read here in Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. It says, Then the seventh angel sounded, and there was a loud voice in heaven saying, The kingdom of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever.
And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were to them. They're teenagers now. They see it. But nevertheless, God always wants to show you the land before you take the land. Because you can never take land that you don't first see. And what's amazing about taking the land is that you find that there were 13 men who go spy out the land. 13. You had a representative from every tribe of, of, every tribe of Israel, but then Joshua also accompanied them. And out of the 13 men, 11 men came back and said, I don't think I can take this land. But there were two men who said, I, can, I believe that we have the wherewithal to conquer the land. And the first thing that I was able to notice with that was that God is not about the majority. God is not into the biggest crowd. God is not into the biggest group. God is not into numbers. And the reason why God is not into numbers is because God doesn't need numbers. God just needs a man or a woman who has the bravery to take the land that God has called them to take. And part of the reason why we're seeing what we're seeing in our cultures and part of the reason why we're seeing what we see in our communities is not because people aren't necessarily praying. People are praying. People are giving. People are sowing. But the problem is, is who's going to take the land? Who's going to go in there and be a land converter after they get out of prayer? After you get out of the presence of God, who's going to go knock down the walls of the courthouse and say, we're not going to have this anymore? Who's going to rally together and say, how can we turn this school that failing into a school that people desire to put their kids in. There's land all around us and God is waiting and he's looking for somebody who's bold enough and strong enough to say, I'm going to take that land. That that which has been functioning in this city is coming to an end. That has been functioning in my family is coming to an end. That that has been functioning in my finances is coming to an end. Not necessarily because I prayed about it and something mystical happened but because I'm taking the position to take the land. Thirteen people see the same thing, but they have different opinions. And what's amazing is that when you begin to study out the viewpoint of Caleb, who was connected with Joshua, their focus was the land. The Bible said, go see the land. Just go see it. And I love the instruction to go see it because sometimes going to see the land puts you in an incubator. And it puts you in an incubator as well as a simulator. And what's amazing about a simulator is that a simulator is designed to condition you into, into thinking you're experiencing something that physically you're not really experiencing it. So, for instance, when an astronaut is getting ready to go into outer space, they will put them in, in a simulator so that their bodies can begin to adjust. Now, they never leave planet Earth, but the simulator is designed to correlate them because whenever you stay in a simulator long enough, by default, eventually you will assimilate. Oh, you got to hear this this morning. And so he puts them in simulators for them to get a taste of it. I want you to go look at it. I want you to go get a taste of it. This is something I learned from my father a long time ago. He said, son, never be afraid to go look at the best. Never be afraid to go walk in the best. Never be afraid to go look at the price tags of the best. Because what God had for the children of Israel, it wasn't some bummy land off in the corner. God says, I want you to have the best land because God always wants to bring his people to the best. Go look at it. 
And there's some of us who are intimidated to go look at things because you think it's you that has to make it happen. God never told them, you're going to win the land. He already gave them the land. But if they never had the strength to at least go walk in the land, go feel the land, go see what it looks like to be in a home like this. Go just sit in a model home and allow your mind to imagine people coming to your door. God said, I need you to go dwell in this land, to rest in it just for a moment. Because when you're in that land, something is going to get stirred up on the inside. If you step into that land, God knows something in you is going to connect with the land that's going to unlock the vision, unlock the ability. It's going to unlock the wisdom on how to bring the land into possession. In simulators that God has you in rooms right now that you don't qualify to be in. There are some of you on your jobs, God has you at tables that you don't qualify to be in. And you're wondering, why am I here? I'm not saying anything. Keep your mouth shut because God has you in that room to learn. God has you in that room to see this is what it's like at the top. This is how they do meetings. This is how they handle situations because God is going to condition you to step into that room one day. But if you never step into the room, you will never be assimilated to simulate into it. Go look at the land. Go walk the land. 250 Cleveland Massillon Road, we have been, it didn't just happen. We were walking that land for years. We're talking to that land for years. And the moment I stepped into that building, my mind went bonkers. I started to see children worshiping over here. I saw the slide coming down into a ball pit. I began to see a bookstore. I began to see people at the altar worshiping God. See, God needs you in that room to assimilate. And there are rooms, I'm telling you, by the Spirit of God, God is about to call you to walk into environments you don't qualify for. God is about to allow you to sit at tables that you don't deserve to be at, but you're not there to go post on Instagram who you had lunch with. You're there to begin to learn the culture of the environment of the land that God is calling you to take. Thirteen people, go see the land. Two have one opinion, eleven have another opinion. The two are just focused on the land. The land is just like God called it. The land is flowing with milk and honey. The fruit of the land is right. Their focus is completely on the land. But 11 people's focus, if you study out that text, it's not on the land. Their focus is on the people in the land. And as they begin to focus on the people, the Bible says that that they begin to compare themselves through the vehicle saying, but I'm just a grasshopper. Now, what's amazing is that they have the same experiences. They all journey out of the same slavery. They all experience the Red Sea open. They all experience the manna fall from heaven. They all experience the water flowing to them to bring nourishment. They all experience the same thing but had two different perspectives. And what's amazing, Pastor, said, I began to meditate on this, and one of the things that I noticed is that their eyes were conditioned to see through their experiences. Because you don't see with your eyes, you see with your mind. Everything you see in the natural is a connection to the mind. Your eyes are just a vehicle to process to your mind. This is why when you go to different nations, you have different terminology for the same thing. Because the mind is conditioned. And what's alarming about the mind will say things like experience is the best teacher It's not necessarily true because God is calling them to step into an uncharted territory and two people are looking at the possibilities, but 11 people are looking at reality. And the reality that the 11 are looking at are the realities of their experiences in life. This is why my past has the ability to give me a huge advantage of wisdom. But my past also has the ability to be a huge hurdle in my life. 
because there's a lot of things that I don't do because of my past. I tried that before. I did it before. I, saw, I tried to start a business before. I tried to plow in that field before. I tried to connect with a church before. I tried to connect with brothers in the house before. I tried to connect with women in the house before. I tried it before. And now God is leading you into a place that's challenging your before. So everything that now has been processed through their mind has stuck with them to lead them to a place where they're not even looking at the land. They're looking at the people in the land. And I'm telling you right now, the land God's called you to, it's already people in that land. There's already people in that land that's more educated than you. There's already people in that land that got more money than you. There's already people in that land that are more qualified than you. There are people in that land that's probably been in that land longer than you've been alive, and God is calling you to take it. See, they're beginning to see themselves through their perspective. And see, what God has to do for some of us as we spy out the land, I'm telling you right now by the Spirit of God, God is trying to challenge and to shift your self-image. Because your ability to conquer the land is not connected to your natural ability. I love the testimony that we heard earlier about the young lady who was able to uh, purchase a property. And, and, and the lady said something to the effect that this never happens. And many times we want the testimony of the never happens and we want the testimony of the rejoicing, but we won't have the courage and the confidence to step into a land that we know we don't qualify for. Man, listen. When we were pursuing this property, I'm telling you about the Spirit of God. That warfare was as t intense as anything I had ever experienced in my life. And you get hit with all types of stuff. Well, how are you going to carry both properties? I don't know. How are you going to move drain lines so you have a clear sanctuary? I don't know. How are you going to build walls? I don't know. Because it's not about me knowing in the natural. It's about me trusting the leading of the Spirit of God. And when God says that every place the sole of my feet tread upon that he has given me, he will unlock supernatural wisdom and supernatural favor and supernatural faith to a man or a woman who will dare to believe God. So God had to condition their minds to take the land. Woo. And we keep reading that passage of Scripture. What begins to happen in, in Numbers chapter number 13, because of, oh, hear me this morning, because of Caleb's position to believe God, the people made a decision to say, you know what? We need to stone Caleb. And I'm telling you now, when you start talking that talk of more than enough, and when you start talking that talk of going beyond where you are, and when you start talking that talk to believe that with God I can do all things because he gives me the strength, there are some people who don't want to hear it. And the reason why they don't want to believe it is because their mind is conditioned in reality. realistic. I don't know how that's going to happen. See, when we were pursuing this thing, they, they told us, they said, we were going to banks, you understand what I'm saying, to get this financing. But I'm declaring that, that we are moving in a position we don't need no bank. That's where my faith is at as a ministry. We don't need a bank. We will use our assets for our bank. So you got to call those things that be not as though they were. We are moving out of the need of a bank. We're going to use the bank to make money. That's what we're going to use the bank for. But nevertheless, they're, saying, they're telling us, they say, well, the only way we will do this deal for you is you got to sell 989 North Portage Path. That's the only way we're going to do it. Now, we didn't want to sell 989 North Portage Path. Because the wealth that's in the land. Yeah. Apostle, can I, can, I, can, I share, can I share that right quick? So, 
I got, I'm trying to show you how things start to move supernaturally. Last week we were having a discussion, and you remember we were talking about you got to get up. You got to get up to start pursuing. When we begin to pursue that all hell but all increase begin to break out at the same time. And the banks kept saying, you got to sell the land for us to do the deal. Now, we're, we're in here in the situation now. We've already put down about $100,000, so, so we can't get our money back. But what's amazing is that the landowner says we're going to be the bank to push the deal through for you and the property. Now, they were trying to get us to give up 989 North Portage Path. How long have we been here? About 12, 12 years? 12 years. Wow, that's a long time. Boy, somebody could have had a doctorate degree by that time. Ooh-wee. Man. We received a letter in the mail that they discovered there is oil on 989 North Portage Path. Now, we've been here 12 years. We never got a letter about no oil. Why do we get a letter about oil when we start stepping into a land that we need provision to sustain the... You, you got to see me. See, there are things that are held up in your life because you won't step into what God has anointed you to step into. You're trying to figure it out after the deal is done. You're trying to process it in your mind. Well, what if and what how? God is saying you need to cancel all that and learn how to begin to walk by faith and not by sight. So now, even if you do sell the land, the land is more valuable. How is this happening? It's supernatural. But there's giants in the land. So what? But they're more educated than me. So what? But their cousins run the company, and I'm sure that the grandson is next for promotion. So what? If God has called you to take the land, you got to know that God is with you to take the land because land takers have a different perception about life. Land takers see the same problem, but they have a different view. They see the same issue, but they have the same perspective because to a land taker, all things are possible. So I begin to ask God, God, why does Caleb have a different perspective than the rest of the spies? And God took me to the scriptures in the book of Numbers, chapter number 14. I think it's verse number 21. I want you to see this. Put it on the screen. I don't think it was in our notes, but you need to see this visibly because I believe this morning I'm among some land takers. Let's go to maybe verse 24. Numbers 14. Let's try verse number 24. What, what made Caleb so different? What, what, what made Caleb so different? Hold on, let me see. I think I have wrote this down. Oh, watch this. Here we go. There we go. There she go. All right, there she go. Numbers 14, verse number 24. But my servant Caleb, he has a different spirit. See, we might be a part of the same church, but I got a different spirit. And we might be a part of the same city, but I got a different spirit. And we might be a part from the, we may have come from the same womb, but that don't mean we got the same spirit. And Caleb came from the same place that everybody else came from, but he had a different spirit. And a land taker has a different spirit because a land taker doesn't see himself taking the land, but he sees God through him taking the land. Look at your neighbor and say, don't be worried. I just got a different spirit. Just let them know this morning. I just got a different spirit. That's all it is. 
And what happens is real, recognize real. And when you get around a land taker that got a land taker spirit, something comes alive on the inside of you. And you start to imagine and you start to dream beyond the lenses of rationality and beyond the, the restraints of realistic things from my past. My past is not who I am and it will not determine where I'm going because where I'm going and his eyes have not seen it, ears have not heard it, it has not entered into the hearts of men, the things that God has for you. If you're a land taker this morning, give God a shout of praise. <laughs> Glory to God. A land taker. So you got to have that perspective. Whatever industry you're in, you can't have a mindset, I'm just here to make a buck to sustain my family. you got to have a mindset, I'm here to take the land. I'm here to corner the market on whatever it is I'm doing. And God will raise you up to the top because the top is where the influence is. And because, hear me, because they wouldn't take the land, God was angered. And I'm going to show you what he did as a response to their refusal to take the land. God said, you know what, here's what we're going to do. It took you 40 days to spy out that land. And you come back to me. We're the poor talking that nonsense of rationality and facts. God said, I can't do nothing great with a people like that. Because, see, that type of people live in the real world. And I need these people to live in his world. And God said, I realize I, th there's a breach of perspectives and there's a breach of opinions. And we right now have irreconcilable differences. So here's what we're going to do. We're just going to cut ways. And what I'm going to do is this, is that we're going to let those who are rational thinkers, you're going to just die off. Because I'm going to release plagues to make sure you die off. But then what we're going to do on top of that is we're going to take everybody who's under the age of 20 years old, people who ain't got experience, people who don't know about the past, people who don't know much about the history, people who was in strollers when they was crossing over the Red Sea, ain't got a lot of experience, ain't got a lot of backlog of a story, ain't got no long resume, but they know the power of God. And there's some of you this morning, I'm telling you, this is why when Jesus chose disciples, he ain't picked trained people, he ain't picked those who were scholars. He picked young men who were just had a heart and a passion who could realize a shepherd and a rabbi for who he was and they followed after him despite what the resume was. He picked people who would just follow. So now he says, you know, we're just going to let them die off. And we're going to wait for Nate to get older. And, and, and we're going to wait for Alex to get older. And we're going to wait for Javi. We're going to wait for Javi to get older. Because, see, the senior saints, they, they thinking about their past. See, what happens in your past is the past starts to bleed out of you. And you know your past starts to bleed out of you when you start raising children and you tell them, don't trust no man because I trusted a man. And look at where it got me. Always have your own. Always protect yourself. Always keep yourself. And then you grow up with all these boundaries of confusion and wondering why you can't love because I've been trained and I've been conditioned with somebody who has a dark past and their past has now bled into my life. And so now I'm in balance and I'm confused because somebody scorned, allowed their blood to flow into me. Mama was trying to protect me, but she didn't know she was doing more damage than she was good. So now I'm in a relationship and I can't open my heart because mama taught me how to keep boundaries and keep my heart closed. God is saying that generation deuces. He'd rather raise up the ignorant. He'd rather raise up the adolescent. He'd rather raise up the young man. He'd rather raise up the young girl to go in. He said for 40 years, this is what's going to happen. One by one. You will die off, and I'm going to wait for little Nate to grow up. And outside of Joshua and outside of Caleb, the Bible said everybody else who was under, over the age of 20, deuces. Soon and very soon, they went to see the king. <laughs> see, hear, hear me. God can't build with a mind full of restrictions. 
And a lot of times our restrictions come from our experiences. It comes from reality. I'm just keeping it real. God says, I can't, I can't, I can't. With water and oil, I just don't mix. I spent some time this year in, in Dubai, and what was amazing is that the culture among the Emiratis is to defy the odds. So everything that they build is centered around breaking the marks of what's possible. So they built the tallest building in the world that's nearly twice the size of the Empire State Building because it was said that it couldn't be They build structures with technology that is impeccable, all because somebody said, you can't do it. Their country is, or their providence there, is centered in a mindset. How can we defy the odds? And I'm sitting here processing as I'm going through this country. I said, these people aren't even born again. This is a Muslim nation that believes they can defy the odds. And we as sons and daughters of God have every reason why we can. And it angered God. And I'm going to show you why. You not taking the land, it angers God. And it's bigger than you not believing. Because we understand through Scripture that God chastened them because of their unbelief. But them taking the land wasn't necessarily about their unbelief as much as it was about what he wanted to do through them taking the land. Well, what does God want to do through them taking the land? Let's stay in the book of Numbers, chapter number 14. Let's see what God wanted to do with them taking the land. Verse number 21. Numbers 14, verse number 21. Let's go back to verse number 20. This is after Moses goes in and say, listen, God, come on, man, don't do them like that. You know, talk about the killing them, you know, let them live. Moses was always trying to, Moses was interesting, man, because on one hand, he was complaining about them. Then on the other hand, after God listened to his complaints, God said, well, you know what, Moses, let's just kill them. That was God's response to Moses' complaints. And then Moses would say, no, 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 let's not go that far. Let's show him a little mercy. Then they get into another situation, and Moses, I'm so tired of these people. And God would be like, me too, let's kill them. <laughs> and Moses would be like, no, 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 God, we can't do it. Are you sure, Moses? I'm sure. Please relent. God will relent. And Moses get fed up again, and you know, God said, well, let's kill them. Uh, some of you are going to remember that part of the service. <laughs> but verse number 20 says, then the Lord said, watch this. Then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word. Watch this. This is why God was so angry. But truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. He wanted them to take the land for the glory of the Lord. And he knew the glory of the Lord couldn't, take, couldn't cover the earth in a system like that. It couldn't cover the earth in a culture that was in Canaan. So God says, I need you to go take the land so my glory can go. And there are lands that God is calling you to take, not just so you can have a six-figure salary, but God is calling you to take that land because he wants the glory of the Lord to cover the earth. See, when I know I'm being called to take the land because he wants his glory to cover the earth, it's a different perspective. Because now it's not about my retirement plan. It's a bigger picture. We're going to get into this next week. I'm going to challenge your motivation. Because anybody who took land for God, it had to be motivated in the right space. See, part of the reason why we don't see what we should see is because the motivation is not where it needs to be. See, a lot of times the motivation for us increasing is just so we can go on a vacation. 
God is not anti-vacation. But if the motivation is just for the vacation, you're not on the same page. I've been doing business things since I was a kid. I was a kid on the bus selling suckers for 50 cents. My whole life has always been that way. I don't know why I got wired me. Mom would take me to the store. You can get one thing. Instead of getting a toy, you know what I bought? I bought candy to sell on the bus. I've been that way my whole life. Amen. It's out there. I'm going to get it. I've been wired that way my whole life. And what's amazing is that in that pursuit, I saw something shift in my economy the more my heart got connected to the kingdom. It was almost as if when my heart was centered in my increase for my increase, it was as if I would see the gyra of God. Some of you don't know who Jaira, Jaira is uh, uh, enough. And I saw him move in enough. The bill would be paid. The note would be taken care of. There would be food in the cupboard. And it was always enough. And that's where some of us are in this house. We, there's enough. But I believe God wants to shift it from enough to more than enough. And I noticed that the more my heart began to connect with his heart, to say, God, my motive and desire for going into the marketplace has nothing to do with my personal desire for material things. Because that used to be my desire. Don't judge me, man. Don't act, like, don't act like there are things you want in your life. Some of you right now working doubles and triples just to get some things, some stuff. And that's where I was. I wanted more. And I knew if I worked for it, I would. You get it. You want it, go get it. And I worked for it, and I was getting it. But it was coming with toil. You understand what I'm saying? Like, it was, it was coming, but I'm having to press forward in a way that I'm not really seeing his grace move. I'm seeing my hands move. And my hands are producing enough. But the more my heart, God began to challenge my heart on the kingdom. And began to challenge my motivation. This is where we're going next week. Our motivation for the land. What's your reason for taking land? Because we'll shout about the land. Yeah, whoa, they're going to take the land. But why? See, why do you want to become from manager to supervisor? Why do you want to become elevated in a business owner? Why? What's your why? And I'm telling you, as long as your why is centered in you, It will move, but it will not move to the degree that it could move. Because naturally, there are byproducts of decisions. You know, and sometimes people will ask the question, well, it seems like I'm doing everything right for the Lord, and I look at somebody else, and, 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 and they're getting stuff. Just because you don't serve God don't mean you can't work a job and make money. But there's a difference when the blessing is on a man or a woman's life. And the more you allow your heart to connect with the kingdom of God, say, God, I'm in here for one reason. It's to take these resources to build your kingdom in the earth. Friend, you're going to live off the overflow better than you live off of your toys. Go to Mark chapter 9. We're going to stop. I think the Spirit of God has spoken a little bit today. What do you think, Mr. Bond? He's spoken a little bit today. Go to Mark. <clears throat> God is shifting some things in us, church. And if you have an ear to hear, You're about to step into your greatest hour. 
I don't even need to scream or shout that. He's speaking by his spirit and conditioning this house. And part of the reason why he's conditioning this house and speaking by his spirit in this mannerism is because time is winding down. And the works that he is doing now, it's a quick work. And where God is leading us, Mark chapter 9, verse number 23, we're talking about I spy. As you spy out that land that God has called you to. Once again, I'm not talking, when I say land, we're talking about Eretz. We're not talking about just that, black, that piece of land on the corner, that bacon house down the street. I'm talking about wherever there are systems, wherever there are laws, wherever there are resources, wherever there is wealth, that is the land God has been calling us to take. In Mark chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus said this to them, to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Mark 9, 23 is the mindset of a land taker. We're going to stop right here this morning. But as we close, I want you to begin to process, especially for you land takers, man. I realize some people, glory to God, man, they, I love them, but they ain't going to do nothing. They're going to be in the same place five years from now that they are now. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But I know by the Spirit of God, there are some people here, you're land takers. And Mark 9, 23 has to be the lenses that you see through. All things are possible to him who believes. And man, I would ride past 250 Cleveland Madison Road all the time and say, you're coming into the kingdom. And I'd just go walk the ground. This was before we ever got into the game for it. I said, this is going, this would make a wonderful church. I know apostle and them would do the same thing and just begin to call those things that be not. As though they were. And see, God has a way of balancing the scales. See, if I looked at what we had in the bank, ain't no way we could have made it happen. Actually, we kind of could have pressed to make it happen. Boy, we would have been house po for real, boy. <laughs> I might have had to jump in them reindeer games, man, to keep that, to keep that money going. <laughs> like, hey, we need a money line over here. We got a prophecy line over here, an encouragement line over here, a hope line over here. I need $20. Who need hope today? I need 40 Who needs a miracle today? <laughs> we might have had to play reindeer games, man. That's what I call them, reindeer. And I'm not saying God will speak, you know, prophetically. He will speak and give it an offering. But some of this foolishness we see, that ain't God. And I hope as a house we are well trained to know when God is speaking versus when he is not. Don't ever, I don't even know what I'm saying, don't ever let somebody try to charge you for the gospel. They start saying, well, I, I'll give you a word if you give me some money. You better grab your purse and Bugs Bunny exit lamp. That is not God. And I don't care if they can call your credit card number out and the last two people you don't went on dates with. God does not manipulate his people. But if God speaks by his spirit, it's okay to honor. The Bible says honor the gifts. Nevertheless, man, we're, we're calling this thing out, man. And we're believing God concerning this property. And as we're declaring these things, I was talking about God balancing the scales. See, they wanted nearly $4 million. We have $4 million, but we have $4 million faith. See, we could believe God. And check this out. They start dropping the price. Hear me, apostle. They start dropping the price. And we said, well, would you consider... One point, what was it, first time? 1.8, something around 1.8, 1.6 million dollars. They said, you know what they told us? We are not interested in giving it away. And 
we got that building 50% of the original offer we made. See, land takers have to keep their eyes on God, man. God is your source. God is your provider. God, see, your job is not to figure out how is he going to do it. It's to believe that he said. And what he said, he is faithful to fulfill what he has promised. And you have to know what God has promised you because there are things we're trying to get God to move on. He ain't, that ain't when his promise. That's why some are not seeing what they want to see. He never said that. That's just your flesh wanting that. See, when he does it, I'm t- it's supernatural. Everything that's happening in this move is supernatural. We found out we got to build walls, but we can't build walls without permits. And you can't get a permit without an architect. So I just go on to Google and I start calling architectural firms in the city of Akron. And every architectural firm we call, there's this long list. They're like, listen, we can get to you in about three months. We can get to you in about four months. Man, I need this done tomorrow. Yesterday, I don't have four months to wait. And I call one particular company. And he said, they put me on the phone with one of the designers. He said, you know what, sir, you won't believe this. We were actually looking to purchase this building. We have all of the plans. We have all of the specs. We can put it together for you in no time. It's just supernatural. Whatever comes up, God provides when you begin to just walk by faith and not by sight and say, God, I'm going to trust you. And the deeper and further you get away from shore, the more you got to trust him. And the more you got to rely on him. And the more you got to depend on him. Because as a church, there is no sandbank beneath us. We are out here, man. And we just trust in God every step of the way. So how does that begin? Every vision starts with seed form. Every land, excuse me, starts in seed form. And the seed form is the vision. What do you spy with your eye? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace, your spirit. And I thank you that right now you're speaking to hearts. I thank you that every but that has held many hostages, Lord, that you're removing that. Lord, that you're raising up land takers in this ministry, Father. Land takers to take the political field. Raise up land takers to take the entertainment industry. Land takers to take the sports industry. Raise up land takers to take the banking industry. Raise up land takers, Father, in this house that would dare to believe you. And I thank you, Lord God, that those who spirit is connecting with this, that as Caleb had a different spirit, I thank you that that spirit of faith is rising in our hearts. Faith to believe, faith to trust you, faith to walk in the promise as opposed to the conditions of reality. Lord, this year is a supernatural year. And I thank you that every man and woman under the sound of my voice who has the courage to step out of their comfort zone, let Lord God that you meet them the same way you met this church in this transition and the same way you met the lady who testified about the new home. Lord, meet us as we take steps in taking the land. Open our ears that we may hear your voice. And I pray over every married couple that is here. I bind the spirit of division. 
But Lord, connect their unity to be one because one can set a thousand to flight, but two, ten thousand. I declare that marriages will operate in a greater degree of power and strength this year than ever before. Allow them to take the land of their home. Allow them to take the land of their neighborhood, the land of their city. Father, we declare that this city belongs to Jesus. We declare this city belongs to the Lord. We declare that every place the soles of our feet tread upon, you have given given unto us. So we call in schools and we call in hospitals and we call in commercial real estate property. We call in, Lord God, positions of power among us as a people that we may be the lender and not the borrower. God, you are accelerating this house. You are increasing us in wisdom and stature and favor with God and with mankind. I declare our greatest hour is ahead of us. I declare our greatest day is ahead of us. We say death to the old and welcome to the new. I declare a breaking of every stronghold that has held hearts in a place of limitation. I declare that the generational curse of poverty, the generational curse of lack, the generational curse of not enough is broken off for every partner of this ministry, Father. Mm. But we're rising. And Lord God, we're rising with strength and declaring that we shall take the city for you to be glorified, that your glory will cover the earth as the water does the sea. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear what you're saying to your church. May you be glorified. May you be honored. In Jesus' name. And while every head is bowed and every eye is closed, you may be here and say, I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to join us today for our message. I trust that the word was inspired, encouraging, and enriched you in your journey and walk of faith. Listen, you may have never made a confession of faith in Christ Jesus. I want to simply give you the opportunity to invite Christ into your heart. Simply make this confession of faith out of your mouth and believe it in your heart. But say, Dear Heavenly Father, I repent of sin, both knowingly and unknowingly. I believe that Jesus died and was raised from the grave that I might be justified. I receive you today as my Lord and as my Savior. I thank you for filling me with your precious Holy Spirit that I may better know you and that I may better serve you. Friend, if you prayed that prayer for the very first time, Christ is now alive on the inside of you. You have received the gift of eternal life. I want to encourage you to connect to a Bible teaching church. If you live here in the Northeastern Ohio area, I invite you to come and worship God with us. Listen, also, if this message has blessed you, has ministered life to you, and I want to encourage you to sow into the ministry. The Bible says when we receive of the food or the word of God spiritually, that we're to sow naturally and truly as offerings and gifts of love that enable us to continue to do what we do to bring the gospel to you right where you are. So we appreciate every gift of love that you sow into this ministry. Truly, you are making it happen. Well, until next time, I would encourage you to journey throughout your week and continue to look, love, and live like Jesus. I'll see you here next week. God bless.